we start with a remote uh, presentation uh, by Roland uh, Zumkeller, who is currently in Italy, I guess. Uh, he'll, he'll, uh, Roland will introduce us to uh, the SmartPy uh, programming environment for uh, Tezos smart contracts. Roland? Um, hello. So, as Michel said, this is um, a talk about SmartPy. And um, I have uh, very few slides, so I hope you can see them. And um, so SmartPy is a, a library um, that allows you to write uh, smart contracts for the uh, Tezos blockchain. And um, as Michel already alluded to in his uh, brief introduction, it is also um, an environment that allows you to do um, other things. Uh, so you can test your contracts locally before you deploy them. And then you can actually deploy them um, after compiling them to Mikkelsen. And once your contracts are on the chain, you can interact with them. Um, so I'm going to show you this in a minute, um, each one of those. And uh, just one more slide before about the architecture of SmartPy. So SmartPy consists of a core uh, that is written in OCaml, um, which we call SmartML. Uh, it is currently not exposed to the user, so you don't really need to worry about it, but uh, it may be in the future. Um, SmartPy, as the name uh, implies, is, um, is Python-based. So um, just like NumPy, uh, you, you can import it as a library. And if you already have some development or a, a website, and you'd like the ability to, to deal with smart contracts, uh, you can add it. And um, But given this architecture that we have a, um, a, a core written in OCaml that takes care of all the symbolic manipulation, uh, we uh, plan in the future perhaps to also have other front ends like uh, JavaScript would probably make sense. Um, and finally, uh, there are two different ways to um, do SmartPy. So you can go to the website, uh, smartpy.io, um, and there's an IDE on there. And um, there's a command line interface as well if you prefer to uh, live in Emacs and the Unix world. So uh, let me change uh, the visible window. One second. Can you see the my web browser? Yes, it's fine. OK, great. Thanks. Um, so this is what you see when you go to um, um, smartpy.io. Um, and um, well, let's write a smart contract. So um, I'd like to start with something very simple. So um, uh, we first import smartpy as a library. Um, then we define a class. So uh, the first contract is just going to be a, a trivial contract that counts um, how many times it has been called. And so we inherit from the contract class. This is what any SmartPy contract uh, inherits from. Then we define a constructor. OK, so just a regular Python constructor. Well, maybe you can and enlarge the, the size of the font, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you. How's this? That's fine. Okay, great. Um, so here we're calling self.init. So this is calling the constructor of the superclass um, with one argument, n, um, initialized to zero. So that means we allocate storage um, for one field uh, that we call n. And this is the storage that is going to be um, stored on the chain. Now, what else do we need? We want an entry point, of course. So for writing an entry point, you call this decorator first, and then you write a method. So we are going to have one um, a method that we call increment. Okay. And all it's going to do is to increment this counter n that we defined above by one. OK, um, so you have to write self.data uh, and I'll uh, get into why uh, a little in a bit. Um, 
So that's our smart contract for now. Um, we initialize the counter to zero, and every time we call uh, the, the entry point increment, we increment it by one. Um, now, in order to do anything with it in Smart Pi, you have to define a test first. So here we go. We uh, going to do just that. Um, so a test pretty much always starts by creating a scenario. So a scenario is a thing in which you can um, do all sorts of experiments locally. You can um, um, create contracts, call contracts, um, have contracts call each other, et cetera, et cetera, and simulate it locally first. So I'm creating an instance of the uh, counter contract that we defined above, and I'm going to add it to the scenario. So this is done like this. Um, and furthermore, I'm going to call the increment uh, uh, entry point once. All right. Um, now I click here on run. And uh, let's see, is this readable? Yes, so we're getting back a lot of information. Um, so first, um, initially, the balance of the, of the contract is zero. Um, uh, let's not worry about the, that for the moment. Then we see the initial storage, which no surprise is um, zero. And then here, SmartPy parrots back the, um, that is what we wrote. Uh, this is sometimes useful if um, for more complicated contracts because of the uh, nature of SmartPy that you do uh, meta programming. It's sometimes good to know what SmartPy actually understood. Um, but uh, I'll show you an example of that in a bit. Um, then we have one interaction here with the uh, uh, contract, which is the entry point increment that has been called once. Um, now we can add a and importantly, the, the storage afterwards is what, uh, as you might expect. Let's do this um, again. And so we let me add two calls to increment here um, and run this again. So this has not been updated here. And we can see that there are indeed three, um, three um, uh, transactions. And each time, the account is introduced by one. Okay, um, I should also mention that we have a um, reference manual. So here you go, if you can find it in the help menu. Um, there is a dark theme. If you prefer to work at night, that might be handy. Um, and there is a set of examples, um, which uh, I guess I have to zoom out just to show you the menu. Um, so you can load templates. If you click one of those, a smart contracts load. And, um, and, and you can explore what it does. Now, uh, this is still a bit boring, um, having just an um, incremental by one. So first of all, let's make some changes here to make it slightly more interesting. Um, so I'm going to add a parameter to the increment uh, entry point, okay, which is called x. And instead of one, we're going to uh, um, increment by x. Um, push run again. Now I'm getting an error because uh, here uh, I forgot to uh, specify uh, what x is. So let's increment by one and by five and then by two. Um, okay. So oh, I'm sorry. Um, This is uh, actually uh, you, you don't you don't write the uh, if you have a single argument you don't write the uh, you don't write the name of the argument okay so um, what else can we do we can look at the output here um, so uh, there's the the Mikkelsen code of course so this is the result of the compilation and um, so. Uh, you can see the, the, the Mikkelsen instructions, and on the right, each time um, for each instruction, you get the 
uh, you, you, you get this, the current stack. So um, initially, you have the parameter and the storage. Um, after a dupe instruction, you get just the same thing twice. Uh, and then you project on the right. You have only the storage uh, on the top of the stack, et cetera, et cetera. OK. Um, then we have a types tab, which uh, tells us a little bit about uh, um, what the contract looks like from the outside. So um, it tells us that n is an int or a nav. So we have type inference going on here. You don't actually have to write types, uh, but uh, SmartPy infers them for you. And then there's a single entry point that takes in uh, an integer or a natural number. OK. Um, let's add another entry point. And this time, uh, well, let's decrement instead of incrementing. And let's look at the code again. So here's what the compiled Mickelson for this uh, um, contract looks like. So um, this if left here distinguishes the two entry points. You have a comment here that uh, explains which one is which. And then, well, you can see that for the um, decrement entry point, you, you call the sub instruction as you would expect. And for the increment uh, entry point, you call the add instruction as you would expect. Um, now, uh, Christian, I think, mentioned this morning that um, uh, there was not much time to compare things um, between uh, Lego and SmartPy. Um, I thought we might just do a little bit of that. So um, here is the same contract in Lego. And um, here is the compilation result on the right. Um, so um, some things are similar. You have um, uh, the if left uh, instruction and uh, well, subtract and add. Um, if you carefully count the instructions, um, you will find that there are uh, fewer ones here. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, and well, one, two, three, a little bit more here. So of course, this is constantly evolving, and um, um, I know that at Lego, uh, people are also working on um, improving the compiler. But um, and this may look very different in a month. Um, I just wanted to show it in the spirit of friendly competition. Um, all right, so um, enough counting. Are, are there any questions uh, up until here? OK. No. So um, oh, yeah, I wanted to show you something else. So uh, in scenarios, you can also um, not just call entry points, but you can also um, um, verify conditions. So for example, um, um, if after calling um, increment uh, once with one and then again with two, uh, um, you want to check that, uh, in fact, your um, storage now has a certain value, maybe uh, probably three. So let's uh, just check that. OK, have to write that here. and. Um, run again. Uh, so nothing happens here because uh, the condition is true. But let's say I have a bug in my increment function. And instead of incrementing, I actually uh, decrement. Um, then this is slightly odd. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I called the, I, I, uh, it is s.verify. OK, so now I get, as I expected, um, an error. So it's, it's telling me uh, this condition is violated. And it's uh, line 22. I click here, and it takes me uh, to that line. Um, and also on the right-hand side, you can see uh, the error message. So this is useful for testing. Um, you can also do uh, really create arbitrary HTML on the right-hand side. So if you, um, I don't know. To add a headline here, do that, and um, oh, I still have the error here. So let's let me fix the increment function first. Um, so here now I have this uh, coding experiment uh, from uh, here, the headline. Um, okay, so that's. Uh, 
all of it for the uh, counting. Oh no, one more thing. Of course, we 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 want to buy the contract, don't we? So um, let's do that. Um, we go back to the Mickelson tab here and um, click on uh, deploy contract. Okay. Um, here you can enter your uh, private key. So um, here is a bunch of private keys I have prepared. Let's take one of them and paste it here. And now, um, here's some settings. We don't need to change any of them for this contract. So I just click on the boy contract now. And I can see the result here. So it's already applied and it gives me the address of the contract. Um, now let's um, explore the contract. Uh, so I click here on Open in Explorer. Here you can really type in any um, smart contract uh, address, uh, be it a smart pie contract or um, legal contract or whatever. And it will give you some information about the contract. So um, this is similar to, uh, to other blockchain explorers like uh, um, Better Call Dev, video, uh, whatnot. Um, but um, I can also uh, interact here with the contract. So uh, if I want to increment, I tell it, well, increment by free, free, build the message, and um, the, uh, sorry, uh, I enter my key again here. And I'm sending the transaction to the chain now. Okay, so it tells me set is applied, which means the uh, transaction went through. So um, as we can see here, the initial storage was zero. If I now reload that page, um, it is still zero, probably because it's still um, making its way into the chain. But if we reload in uh, 20 seconds, uh, I promise it will show three here. Oh, there we go. Okay, and we can view the operations also. So um, this tells us there was a single operation at this time and date, and uh, successful, we incremented by three, and afterwards the storage was free. Um, I should mention, if you want to try this at home, you need to obtain a private key first. So to do that, you just click on the uh, Tezos Posit Importer here, and you follow the instructions. So you go to another website, you need to copy and paste something, and you will end up getting uh, uh, a private key. Okay, so let me close these, and let's do something a little bit more interesting. Um, so uh, what everybody seems to be doing these days uh, are uh, fungible assets. Uh, so here is um, a simplified um, uh, fungible asset contract. So let me briefly go over uh, what this does. Um, so uh, this contract has two fields. Uh, um, we specify an administrator and uh, that has some sort of uh, special powers. And then we have a ledger of balances. Okay. Um, so let's look at the types right away. So I click run. SmartPy should tell me what the types are. Um, so it tells me that uh, admin is an address. Um, so everything starting with a capital T is a type. And so this is the type of the Mickelson types. Uh, so we have an, an address and a ledger of balances, which is a big map that for each address uh, um, that has deposited coins with us, we have that number of coins on the right hand side. Of course, they are not these are not Tezos coins, but the coins that our asset represents. Then we have two helper functions. Okay, so um, increase balance, uh, which, um, well, uh, for an address X uh, increases the balance by a certain amount. So the way this works, it, it first looks into the balances uh, data structure, whether um, X already has an account with us. If so, it is increased by the amount. If not, we uh, add a new uh, entry into the ledger initialized to the amount. Similarly, to decrease the balance, um, we uh, first compute the uh, 
balance uh, the new balance, um, then we uh, check uh, that it is positive. So um, sp dot verify is a um, um, command that uh, checks that the condition is verified, and if the condition is is uh, violated, it fails. So then the the whole transaction will abort. Then we check. Um, well, if uh, all the money that's been withdrawn, the uh, entry in the ledger is deleted, and otherwise we update to the new value. So note that these two methods here have not been annotated as entry points. So these are just helper functions. Um, here are our, helper fun our entry points. Um, so uh, transfer um, allows someone to send a certain amount of points to a destination. So destination is an address. So um, you can see that here also, you have the types of the parameters. So amount and dest, uh, amount is an integer and uh, dest is, the, uh, is an address. So it decreases our balance, sp.sender is uh, the caller's address and it increases the uh, balance of the um, destination. Um, by the way, the order of these doesn't matter. So there's this, uh, um, Classical problem, if you will, of uh, something failing between these two that you find in any uh, computer science textbook uh, does not apply here because uh, um, in, in Tezos, uh, transactions are atomic. So if something goes wrong, the whole thing will go wrong. And the second entry point we have uh, is uh, mint. So this allows the administrator to mint money. So importantly, we have this line here, and uh, which verifies that the sender is uh, the administrator. So that means if somebody else tries to call this, uh, it should fail. Only the administrator can um, create money. Okay, so that's the contract. Um, we have an administrator, a ledger, and it means to transfer tokens and uh, uh, means to mint tokens. Now let's test this. Um, so here's the test case that we defined. We have three addresses, uh, and we do the usual setup here of the scenario. And then the interesting part are these five calls here. So we uh, first call, um, have the administrator call the mint function. So if you remember, I don't know if we still have the previous example. Uh, yeah, here we just call an entry point C dot increment. That's it. Here we call the entry point c dot mint and also say dot run sender equals admin. That means we're wearing the hat of the administrator for this call because it's important uh, who you are. So um, this is determining the value of this SPSN uh, here. Um, so what happens here? Um, the administrator mints um, five coins for Alice, right? Then they mint uh, five coins for Bob. Then Bob, notice that this is Bob here, um, sends um, three coins to Alice. And then he does just this again. Um, and finally, uh, uh, Bob is trying to mint money, uh, namely 100 coins. So let's see how this plays out. So we have the transactions here. And uh, let's see. Um, so this is the first call. Um, so you can observe that this address here with the MK at the end is just um, uh, the administrator's address. So this corresponds to the first call, we minting five uh, coins. The balances in the ledger are updated. So now we have a key and the value here uh, that represents just one entry. Then the administrator does the same thing again, this time for, um, for Bob. And now we have two entries. So each of Alice and Bob have um, five coins. And third transaction, Bob sends three coins to Alice. Well, as you would expect, the uh, values are updated. So Bob now has fewer coins, Alice has more. And then, so you can already see this is in red and instead of OK, it says KO. And um, um, we have a, a violation of a condition here. Why? Well, because Bob ran out of money. He has only two coins and is trying to send uh, more to, to Alice. And um, so therefore, this condition gets uh, uh, violated. So if you click on 
line 16 here, it takes you right there and you can see what went wrong. Um, and then Bob becomes completely desperate, is trying to mint money and um, well, of course it doesn't work because the mint function checks that uh, um, the, the sender is the administrator, which Bob isn't. Um, so this valid uh, false, I should mention here. Um, so without this, uh, let me just delete this um, and run again. So I get an error. So in order to say we expect a failure, a uh, failure in this test, we want to test that. Uh, so failure can be desired. So clearly you want the contract to fail if somebody else tries to make money. Um, so you can test such things. Um, so I promised you that there's not only um, a website, but also a command line interface. So let's have a quick look at that. I just need to switch my um, screen again. Can you see that? Yes, you can. So um, here we have exactly the same uh, uh, file, just uh, uh, the same thing that I just showed you in the browser. Uh, if you hear me, uh, can you have, uh, use bigger fonts and maybe um, uh, use reverse video or something like that? Black, black on white is better than gray on gray. Oh, OK. Uh, sure. No, um, sorry. Oh, yeah, of course, I just need to go here. Um, well, oh, appearance would be, wouldn't yeah. it? Um, at, at least make it bigger. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right. Oh, here we go. Uh, Colors. I will also make it bigger. Uh, so let's uh, change the background to um, white. Not really, not very good at this. Um, no. Oh, there we go. Yeah, this is slightly better, yeah. Okay, there we go. And uh, let's make it bigger. Perfect. Okay, sorry. Um, so as I said, we have this one file here, and now uh, we're going to call SmartPy on it. So SmartPy at the moment is a, has a wrapper script. So when you just call this with help, it will give you well, a help message. And the, what we're going to do now is just test the contract. So we're going to specify um, this contract file, the Python file, and then output the directory. So let's do that. We have this fungible asset file, and I'm going to um, use the out contract directory. Okay. So now we have created the directory, which contains a bunch of uh, files. So let's look, let's look at two of these. Um, first of all, just the contract code. Okay. So this is exactly the same thing that we just saw in the browser also. Um, so we just to make us a uh, compilation result. And then also the test.output file that um, we have the exact same five transactions. So um, the administrator minting coins, then 
Bob um, sending them, etc., etc., and also the expected failure here. And um, so it's it's functionality-wise one-to-one what uh, what you can do in the browser, um, except for that this is more convenient if you want to automate tests, so you don't need to um, click your way through the uh, all the buttons every time. Um, all right, so uh, let's look at yet another contract. Um, this time, the idea is to show you uh, what we mean by metaprogramming. So, metaprogramming really means that you have a, um, a program that writes a program, if you will, or in this case, a program that writes a contract. So, let me first introduce briefly this contract here. So, this is a game of tic-tac-toe. Okay, so we have a board, a three by three board, which initially has minus ones everywhere. Then we have two players, zero and one, and then we have a field next player, which remembers whose turn it is, okay? Um, there's a single entry point here, play, um, which gives you, well, uh, what you need to play and to, to specify a row in the column. Um, so, um, the, uh, four parts here. So the first part uh, is we simply check that the game is not over and that only the player whose turn it is can play. Uh, okay. uh, Roland, we see only your terminal uh, window here. You oh, that's terrible. Okay. Sorry, I forgot to, I forgot to <laughs> switch it. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, Okay, so yes, tic tac toe, three by three board, uh, two players. Um, here we remember the next player. Um, let's have a quick look at the types. Um, so the board, um, so a matrix, uh, three by three matrix is uh, represented in uh, SmartPy and I guess Mickelson as a map from integers to a map from integers to um, integers in this case, okay? Then the next player is just an integer, which is will be 0 or 1 all the time. Um, and then this uh, two uh, uh, element list is also a uh, map, uh, really. Um, there are different ways to do it. So you, you could have used a list here also, if you have two separate fields for player 1 and player 2. These have different implications for um, just how simple the implementation is. Um, all right, so uh, when we play, we first check that the, the game is not over um, and that it's indeed the player's turn. So the, the sender has to be the player that uh, whose turn it is, I guess. Um, and then we have, um, uh, well, we make sure that the cell hasn't been already taken, um, that um, uh, we check the, uh, whether the game has been won. So here we check all three columns and all three um, rows, and then we check, check the two diagonals. If somebody has won, well, then we send them um, one unit of uh, test and um, uh, set next player to minus one, so the game is over. Otherwise, um, we switch from player zero to player one and vice versa. And here's a helper function check rule. So you can define helper functions in Python and uh, call them in your contract. All right, um, as I showed you before, this you can um, run the scenario. So I defined a scenario here with uh, uh, where Alice and Bob just play a uh, uh, turn, and you end up with a board. So here, uh, clearly, Alice is going to win. And uh, here's the board. So it's also play shown in a nice um, two-dimensional fashion. Uh, we don't have too much time left, so I'm going to um, go on to the next bit. Oh, uh, sorry, I promised you metaprogramming, so let's do this quickly. So um, there's a notion of misère, so um, misery. Um, so any game, you can define a variant uh, uh, to it, and in which the, uh, the goal is to lose. So um, when, you, when you play the game, you're trying to actually lose. So. With chess, this is very interesting. Tic-tac-toe, a little bit less, but uh, um, let's let's do it anyway. So I'm going to um, 
Um, but so what I could do now is simply add a, a Boolean field here to the storage, right? Uh, that tells me if I want to play tic tac toe as a Misere game, if it is true, then we invert the, um, the winner. Um, so let me write actually that part first. Um, okay, so he, this is the bit where we d determine the winner. So um, I'm going to write here if um, we are in misere mode, then the winner is not the one who made the last move, but um, well, the other person, the other player. And um, if not, then let's do what we did before. Now, um, when we create the contract, we want to spe specify whether this is, uh, uh, we are in misere mode or not. So I'm, I could add this now. Let me actually just briefly write this like this. Okay. So this would add a third, uh, a fourth field into the contract, which would then be stored on the chain. But this is slightly wasteful because once the contract has been deployed, this is not going to change. So we, we're just storing a constant in the, in the chain and, um, and we pay for it. So, um, because you pay for storage in, on the chain. So let's not do that. Let's in the, in, instead uh, add it to the uh, class, the Python class. Okay. Um, and as you see here, also uh, this um, is not the SP dot if, but it is the if. So we distinguish the smart pi if from the um, um, Python if. So now we have the Python if, and. Um, then here, I'm going to specify there equals true, okay? And let me compile this. Um, yes, so um, if you look at this line, you can see that, um, so the sp if done value, yeah, this, these correspond on the left and the right. And then the next line, it only shows you the um, first case of the of, of this if statement, right? We don't have this winner equals FP sender here. Um, so this means the once the contract is in the chain, we don't um, have this misery field anymore. We just specialize the contract to uh, one of the two cases. So if I change this to false here, we get just what we had at the beginning, namely that um, we're sending it uh, to the sender, uh, so to the last player. Um, so this is what we call meta programming. So without uh, really going into a different language or manipulating strings, uh, anything like that, we can, um, we can have Python programs that write uh, dynamically write uh, smart contracts. So let me show you one more example. Um, you have so two, two the colors conjecture states uh, that um, this function here, um, when repeatedly applied, uh, uh, uses a sequence that always terminates, no matter where we start. So you take a number. Um, so there's an example here. So here's an example. Um, we start with 12. Um, because 12 is an even number, you halve it. Six is even, you halve it. Three is odd. So then you apply uh, this, uh, three n plus one. So three times three plus one is 10. 10 is even, half, and so on. Okay. And there's a conjecture that um, um, this always terminates. But, uh, well, we can't actually prove that use, using blockchain technology, but we, at least we can try it. So. I could now just write a smart contract that, uh, well, just uh, the last, uh, the, the, we, we have, have two, a number. Two or three minutes. And, um, I'm sorry, I, there are three minutes, you said? You have two or three minutes left. OK, thank you. Um, OK, so let's do this very quickly. Um, 
So I'm not just um, writing a loop here and that executes the computes this function, but there are three uh, contracts actually so that communicate. Okay. So um, there's one contract that um, uh, takes uh, two parameters. Okay, a callback, which is another contract. Um, so it, it has one entry point that takes a callback contract and um, an integer, and it will call back the callback contract um, with um, the half of that number. And then we have the same thing for odd, which uh, calls back with the three n plus one. Then, um, so we don't have time to look at this in detail, but uh, then there's the, the main contract, the college contract, that um, um, receives any number. This looks whether it is even or odd, and depending on this, calls either the on-even or the on-odd contract. Um, I just want to show you, um, after deploying this to the chain, what it looks like. Uh, so I have an uh, example of that. Then I just computed this morning. Um, so let's uh, explore this. Okay, so um, the counter is nine. So we, we started with 12 here. Um, and 12 takes nine steps to go to one. And here you can see the operations. So let's start uh, from the bottom. Uh, we, we started with 12. Um, this leads to an outbound operation. So this is a contract calling another contract. Okay. And um, then we get an inbound operation again from the contract calling us back and so on and so forth. Uh, um, all right. Um, I'm running out of time. Uh, let me just show you one feature that is uh, that we're currently working on uh, is uh, decompilation. So with this explorer, you can go to any um, contract written in SmartPy or not, uh, in legal or Mikkelsen or whatever. Um, then, of course, you can look at the, uh, uh, the Mikkelsen code. You get these annotations here, which make it more readable. But, well, it's still quite difficult to read. So what we like to have in the future is something like this. You just click on SmartPy, and it gives you a decompiled version of the contract. Um, um, so, well. This is friendly syntax. It's, it's still a bit clumsy and doesn't work in many cases. So that's why we, this is not public yet, uh, but that's uh, sort of what we're um, aiming for. Uh, all right. Um, let me briefly conclude. Um, um, well, you can go to our website to try it out. Um, things are still evolving, of course. And, um, you can go to a website or use the command line interface. Uh, there's a vibrant community of uh, uh, users on um, Telegram and um, the Slack Exchange mostly. So here are the users. Uh, um, please join us. And um, Michelle told me there was a question from YouTube uh, about how many people are working on uh, SmartPy. Um, so uh, depending on how you count, uh, between, um, well, we have uh, three or four. And um, none of us works on this uh, full time, which is um, interesting. But um, anyway, so um, um, thank you. OK, thank you, uh, Roland. Thanks a lot for this uh, presentation and live demo. Uh, maybe questions in the room? Yes. Hello. Uh, so I want to ask two, uh, two fast questions. The first one is, can we import uh, native uh, Python packages to uh, SmartPy? And if yes, uh, which ones? Uh, the second question is, uh, can we implement or develop a smart contract that deploy dynamically smart contract notion of, uh, of factory? That's it. Uh, I see. Okay, so the first question, um, can we import um, any Python library and package uh, into SmartPy? Um, so um, the answer is yes, but this does not mean that you can use any package on the chain, right? Um, yeah. Um, so this is again to do with metaprogramming. So you have um, um, the, the program that writes your contract can use NumPy uh, or whatnot. Um, but once you're on the chain, of course, you're limited to, to 
to, to the SmartPy language, with, which reflects the constraint of the of the Mikkelsen language. Yeah, well, Colin, if, if you could unshare your screen, we could see your face, and that would be ah, slightly, right. be slightly um, better. Thank you. <coughs> yes, great, great. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, did I answer your first question? So ca can you first mention uh, which packages can we uh, can be can we import or uh, because I searched for that in uh, your uh, documentation and uh, I didn't found anything. Oh, I see. Um, so uh, okay, the slightly more technical answer is um, the uh, if you're doing it in the web browser, um, you will, you have the packages that are um, that come with. Uh, a package called Brighton, which is a, a Python simulator that runs in the web browser. So this is how the website works. Which, by the way, is open source. You can, if you look at our repository, you will find a directory called site, which contains the website. Uh, if you do it locally, it is indeed using your local Python installation. Um, so I guess it depends on whatever you have there. Um, there may be uh, some parameters the arguments to set in order to, to, to actually do this. But uh, um, yeah, if you have difficulty, please do ask on, on Telegram or, or Slack Exchange or, or wherever. Okay. Um, the second question was about um, factories. Um, so there is a, a template on the website uh, the, the multi -sig. That, that is called Tic-Tac-Toe Factory, if I'm not uh, no. mistaken, or also the yeah. multi -sig. Yeah. Um So this is yet another example of, of metaprogramming where you um, uh, what, yeah, one uh, program produce um, several contracts depending on certain parameters. So to, to introduce the, the question in a more simple way, can can we uh, implement an entry point that in a, in, a, in a smart contract by calling it that entry point uh, deploy a smart contract and uh, return uh, returns uh, the address of new smart contract deployed. Um. So you can. Um, um, so this is a question about about Mikkelsen almost. Um, mm -hmm. I believe you can you can create new contracts. Uh, you can create new accounts, but you cannot specify the code. I'm actually I don't want to um, say anything that's wrong. So I'm okay. Well, yeah, maybe I'm if it goes sure. too technical, maybe you can join the the tele Telegram channel and ask that question in that channel. Okay. Uh, yes, any, please do. Any yeah. other questions? Okay. No, so thanks again, Roland. Uh, so you can see me here. Thank thanks. <laughs> okay. Bonne journée. Uh, so let, merci. And let's uh, round it close. The next presentation is by, I had their first names. Uh, so it, they're going to uh, tell us about uh, how to translate or start to uh, translate, um, um, yeah, Madfis solution, thank you. Uh, <laughs> about uh, how to translate uh, solidity uh, into, into